Hello and welcome to another one of our little podcasts. This is Hugh over in Gloucestershire and young Phil over there in London town. Look at that, with the London Cup as well. Um, Mr. Route 6 himself. Uh, today we've got a, a topic we, which fits into something we were talking about earlier, but it's something which is fairly new to me. And this is file-based QC. This is what goes on inside those little files, those dang little things. Um, and how, we, how do we check it? Um, I presume I don't just wheel out my waveform monitor and plug it into into the back. What's well, going on? Well, I mean, uh, funny you should say that, Hugh. If I if I just if I just uh, you reach down under my desk here, oh, what's what's uh, what's what's running down below Phil's desk? What does every engineer have under his desk? Uh-huh, yeah, a nice Tektronix waveform monitor. Um, you know, which you know for, for years has been has been the tool of the engineers. It's how you, it's how you check things for deliverables. But um, it's. You know, the problem nowadays is, is, is that, you know, as we talked in our previous episode on shared storage, um, you know, from a month before with my colleague Rupert Watson, you know, increasingly things arrive at a facility um, not as a videotape um, or, or as, a, as a live incoming feed, but they arrive as a set of files, maybe off a, yeah. a Red One camera or an Alexa or a Sony EX3, you know, an S by S card, you know, shot for television or whatever. And they go all the way through the facility, um, never touching a bit of coaxial cable, never touching, uh, never being turned back into an HDSDI data stream, but the whole time just being files. And then, of course, you finish the edit process. Maybe they get passed through to grade or to audio. And by the end of it, you know, the, the facility owner is saying, well, do I really need to be investing £40,000 in an HDCAM SR deck just to be able to lay this stuff back to videotape to pass it on to a broadcaster who's starting to tell me they want to receive it as files? Or, you know, so you can see that the the need for, um, uh, um, uh, you know, traditional um, uh, monitoring is kind of going. And, yeah. uh, and 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 the need to do all that stuff in the file domain is is becoming more and more um, pressing. Now the the, the 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 thing that's driving all this is is this thing called the DPP, the Digital Production yeah. Partnership, um, uh, and and there are a bunch of sort of technical and creative people in the UK who are driving this push to a, a consistent and well-defined um, uh, file-based workflow and delivery spec, uh, such that we can all deliver um, uh, you know, typically a hundred megabit um, AVC intra file. Um, sometimes referred to as an AS, AS11 file, which is a, an MXF wrapped. This is wrapped. actually quite... Go on, Hugh. This is quite a, a special thing because this is a, this is a, this is a, a, a marriage between, um, or a, a cooperation between manufacturers and uh, broadcasters and including some uh, post houses as well, I understand. In that... So there's quite a little forum that have been working together for a while now. Uh, how long? A year or two? Maybe longer? Uh, I think it's about 18 months. I was, I was doing some yeah. training uh, for a production company last week, Shed Media. They're a big mm-hmm. production um, conglomerate. They, they, they subsumed several production companies about two years ago. And their technical manager was telling me he sits on the DPP uh, board. And, um, and so it's not just... It's not just facilities, not just broadcasters. It's even production companies who are having a say in all this, and you know, more power to them, kind of thing. Um, I've got the I've got the um, the, the the AS11 um, page spec page up. Oh yeah. You, you sorry. You can download the, um, uh, the, the 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 file descriptors, and it's it's essentially it's a hundred megabit um, H.264 wrapped as an MXF file. Um, you know. Uh, uh, but they don't call it H.264, they call it um, uh, AVC Intra, you know, the, the, which uh, H.264 is a, either an MPEG forum or an Apple name, I'm not sure. But it's not, it's not a, uh, uh, you know, considered to be the open name for it. But it's, it's MPEG 4 part 10, um, and, uh, and, and there's a whole specification for how those files should be formatted and delivered. And of course, you know, in a, in a facility where things have arrived as files, gone through the whole production, post-production process, grading, audio process, and then possibly into something like a content agent or an episode engine or Amberfin or some other file delivery you know, thing to wrap all those files together and make the deliverable file, and then maybe delivered to an FTP server at the broadcaster, or maybe over Signiant or or something like that, some other file delivery mechanism. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but but you know, soup to nuts, end to end. Hasn't seen a bit of coaxial cable the whole time. Hasn't been near a Tektronix waveform monitor, uh, or even an iHeight legalizer, or any way of sensibly sort of beating that that content into shape so that it's street legal. And, and just thinking back to the days of, of the Tektronix waveform monitor, you know, if all you're doing is a QC maybe on a composite signal, so going back you know, 20 years maybe, you might have been QCing a one-inch de- deliverable, yeah. and all you've got to pay attention to is the, is the, um, the luminance level and the chroma gamut, and, and that's actually quite easy to do. But nowadays, a poor QC operator has got so much more to consider. You, you, you know, color space is more complicated now with a 709 
color space and you might so you might be looking at a diamond display rather than a vector scope you know you might be having to keep an eye on 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 luminance levels diamond display and there's a whole load of other things like like pse detection um you know and if you're delivering commercials maybe you're going to be worrying about caption heights to so that you're in compliance with the bcap regulations let, let me just pull you up there just go back to the bsc because not everybody will have uh, have realized that television we used to say it wasn't uh, wasn't brain surgery but it turns out it is <laughs> so photosensitive episode absolutely pse is PSE, yes. is an is, is an effect that um uh, has been understood for a long time but it's it was it's only recently um uh, uh been associated with television and it apparently all comes down to an episode of uh pokemon um which was screened in the late 90s in Japan and had a particularly sort of strobey, flashy effect, which caused um, children to suffer epileptic seizure. Apparently, you know, I, I, nobody knows if it's just if it's just like an industry legend or whether it really happened. Uh, and so from then, from the late nineties onwards, people like Channel Four and, and, and other broadcasters started getting serious about making sure there weren't flashing things in in television. Uh, and and uh, so I've just got the, the the Wikipedia page up about photosensitive epilepsy, and in fact they've got a screenshot from the uh, the episode of Pokemon in question. <laughs> there you go. Um, so so but 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 and so the uh, Ofcom had a spec as far back as the late nineties. I, I remember worrying about it on on Big Brother when um, and 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 the Ofcom spec is very straightforward. It says a flash event is defined as. Uh, a frame of video that has more than 80% luminance difference from the frames either side of it. And if that flash event, if you get a fl more than five flash events in nine frames or something like, I can't remember, it's well defined, but th then then you, um, th then that's considered to be, you know, potentially uh, PSE inducing. And, and, and so, you know, you, and, but with that specification, which is very well defined, you can have, um, it's quite easy for a manufacturer to build a machine to detect that and to de detect it in real time and freeze the timecode display and beep, you know. And so there, there used to be a machine called the Flash Gordon, which, mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, on, on, on Big Brother, we had in spades uh, because, the, 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 you know, typically on the Friday night show, there'd be lots of paparazzi footage and, um, and, and uh, it, was, it was the case that we needed to kind of like very quickly nip it in the bud. Um, and uh, just trying to find the... Uh, uh, that they're, uh, they're the broadcaster, uh, broadcast projects. Um, but but um, the, the 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 thing about um, uh, the, the the Flash Gordon was that it 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 it, it, um, it hit the um, requirements of Ofcom brilliantly. But there's another chap called Dr. Harding, who's a well-renowned, nice. um, uh, you know, man in the industry who knows about PSE, and he very quickly produced his own tests for PSE called the Harding. Um, uh, uh, PFA, uh, uh, photosensitive flash analyzer, and um, quite quite quickly, a lot of facilities and broadcasters started to adopt his product um, as a um, uh, as, as something of a standard. And they didn't just conform to Ofcom; they they would say, "No, we, we conform to Harding." The problem with Harding is that nobody knows what he does. Nobody knows what his machine tests for. And it tests for an it tests for an awful lot more than a, than a Gordon does, and so it tests for an awful lot more than the Ofcom spec says it should test for. But of course, if if Red B or the BBC are demanding that you deliver to the Harding spec, well, what can you do? You just have to have a Harding, you yeah. know. Yeah. And and so a lot of people think this is you know iniquitous that that somebody's managed to corner the market, uh, you, you know, and, and 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 nobody knows what their box does. His box does clever things with red flash analysis and with patterning and things like that, and. Uh, more than that, it's only very recently he's had a box that can actually do live analysis. Traditionally, you'd have to ingest your whole program into his box, let it do its analysis, and then hand the report back to the editor and say, look, there you go, you've got to cut those bits out there, there and there, which is hopeless for fast turnaround television. Really it, yeah. so, 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 so I'm not a huge fan of, of Mr. Harding, clever chap that he is, um, and I think that the industry should stick with the Ofcom spec, um, which interestingly is is also uh, encompassed in the DPP spec. The DPP spec makes reference to Ofcom. Now, okay. I'm going to I'm going to try and pull up the the, the I, I should have had this prepped ahead of time. But I'm going to try and pull up the, um, uh, the, the, the 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 DPP document, which I know I was using last week for a training course, so it should be here. Um, it is potentially really helpful, I think, just to just stick it down because uh, although you were saying it, it was just levels and chrominance that we were searching for before, uh, I remember. There were quite a few bits of process which could also mess up the sinks and um, all the blanking lengths. So there was a lot of tweaking to look in. 
obviously that doesn't happen anymore, but there are such a plethora of different files and formats and ingredients in the files that it's really essential for us to have some assistance, otherwise we'll never be able to deliver it. And when you start looking at the DPP uh, uh, stuff, you'll see what, a, what a, an important job it is of, of saying, okay, this is what I'd like to have it delivered as, please. As otherwise, you could have just about any type of file, and it runs into hundreds. Yes, yeah. Well, so so so, the so, are almost endless. so 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 it's 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 rather good that the DPP have specified AS11, you know, which is the ABC intracodec, you know, studio format 42 encoding, yada yada yada. Um, but I'm I'm just I'm just scrolling through the DPP spec now, and they 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 define. We'll talk a little about about files in a second, but they they define yeah. um, pretty much everything. So here we go. I'm, I'm in the audio section now. Um, so talk about oh, the, the, you know, this this is a very comprehensive document. I can encourage people to to pull it from the um, from the uh, DPP uh, site and have a look at it. In fact, the BBC have it on their site as well. So here we are. I've got I've got the section about photosensitive epilepsy, section two point nine. Now, the rather tedious thing about this is um, uh, that they talk about the harding a little bit, um, but they also make reference to the Ofcom spec. But they also oh, this is the wrong version of the document I've got up here. In the in the fuller version of the document, they also talk about. Um, um, uh, what constitutes a flash event? Now, the old Ofcom spec used to say eighty percent luminance difference between two between three frames. The middle frame more than eighty percent difference. The new DPP spec doesn't say that. It says more than a hundred candelas per meter squared of luminosity difference, which is silly because who knows how a domestic television has been set up, and and yes. you know you've got no way of judging that. So they really should stop that and go back to the original percentage spec that's the only thing you can measure you can't really say candelas per meter squared because who knows you know how monitors been set up and at this point people could of course go back and look at our how to calibrate a monitor podcast uh, if, yes. if, if they're uncertain of what candelas per meter squared means and things like that so um so uh, pse that's that's an important little thing that, that has to be considered um uh, and of course that's entirely detectable uh, automatically by software um uh, but but um so, so that typically File-based QC, the, the, the things that, that file-based checkers do, they have to do um, three things. Firstly, they have to check the format of the file to make sure it's a valid computer file. You know, that the, 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 the header and the length relate to each other, checksums are correct. That when it gets copied across a network or sent over an FTP server or whatever, that, that it'll be a correct file when it gets to the other end. You can load it onto your Hewlett-Packard transmission server or your Omnion media grid and it'll work. The next, th the next thing it has to do, and that's an almost instantaneous check, you know, software can check that very, very quickly. The next thing it has to check is it has to check that the, the format of the um, encoded uh, data, so, so, so the, the, the syntax of the codec is correct. So it has to go through and it has to check all the MPEG macro blocks, make sure they're formatted correctly, and that the KLV structure, the key length value structure of the file is correct. Once it's done all that, you know you've now got a file which is not only a correctly formatted computer file, it has correctly formatted um, codec, essence, uh, codec uh, data within it, but then it also has to go in and it has to render out the essence of the file, the video and the audio, and possibly the subtitles, possibly the audio description track, possibly the 5-1 surround that's in there as well. And it has to do all the things that we call traditional QC. It has to check for levels. It has to check, you know, for for you know that the audio isn't clipping and, and and that the gamut's within spec and all those kind of things. So, for software to do all those checks, it's, it's quite a tall order, um, and consequently, software that does that is quite expensive. So, there's there's three pieces of software that I've been familiar with in the past. There's Tektronix Serify, which was kind of the first really one to the market. It's been around for probably six years now. Um, there's there's Intera's Baton package or a baton, as some people call it, um, which is big in the telco market. It's big for video on demand providers and stuff. And then there's VidChecker, which is the one I really like, uh, which I demonstrate a lot to people, which we sell at Route 6. And it's um, it's the same guys who were the Tektronix uh, Serify development team. When, when Serify was kind of a finished product and the development was then moved out to India, these guys left Tektronix and kind of set about building... Uh, Serify 2 with all the things they'd learned and um, I think they've done a fantastic job uh, the, where, where they where they really shine over those other guys is that firstly they don't license it on a per core basis they like they, they just say if you want to check more files just buy a faster computer you know buy a bigger server a more meaty server <laughs> um, and, uh, and and you can check as many files as you want you know on a typical eight core contemporary core i7 type server their system can check about 200 hours of, of HD fully checking it uh, a month 
Um, so if, if you're a very busy facility and you were turning out 200 hours of finished HD material a month, you get, get, you get by on a single um, contemporary, you know, pokey, expensive, two and a half grand type Dell server for running VidChecker on. VidChecker... VidChecker sits on your network and, uh, you know, typically you can either submit files to it manually through its web interface or you can submit files to it by just dropping them in watch folders that VidChecker is keeping an eye on. And when it sees a, f a file appear, it can stop doing things with it. Uh, and of course, it has to be able to see the things you want checking for. So if you've just put something on your Avid ISIS, but VidChecker doesn't have an Avid, Avid ISIS license and isn't mounted on the ISIS, well, you know, it can't do anything. Yeah, if it's stuff arriving on your um, uh, file uh, on your fiber um, SAN, but you haven't put the VidChecker server on the fiber SAN, of course it can't deal with that material. It has to be able to see the material to deal with it. Um, and um, I, I suppose the, the next thing we'll do is is I'll run it up on, on my machine here, and we'll, show it to we'll, we'll 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 do we'll do a QC. So we'll, we'll take a oh, fi yeah, a, fi a, fin a finished commercial and we'll submit it to VidChecker, and I'll take you through how you make a template and how you how, how you have it do it do the tests and what kind of comes up, and hopefully with a following wind, it'll all be tip top. Excited. <laughs> but it'll mean I've got, I've got to stop Skype you, and I've got to reconfigure Skype to screencast my output back to you, so you can see what I'm doing. Are you actually going to show us the real thing then? Yeah, for sure. So, so we've um, we've come back now. I've had to I've had to run Windows on my machine here because uh, because VidChecker is a, is a product that runs within Windows. And so down here you can see uh, just the server status window to show VidChecker's uh, running uh, in my Windows virtual machine. So it might be a bit sluggish because it's in a VM and we're doing H.264 H.264 encoding while we're doing a screen record while Hughes on <laughs> Skype. You know, it's, how how does it work? Who knows? So so this is this is the the, the GUI uh, just running within within uh, Windows. Internet Explorer, and this you'd you'd see this GUI. Um, uh, I just happen to be running it on the same machine that's running uh, VidChecker, um, but uh, you'd you'd see it on any machine on the network that was pointing at the VidChecker server for, for controlling VidChecker. And you can you can see um, you can see that um, uh, here we go. Here's his previous jobs that I've submitted to VidChecker, and you know with varying degrees of success have run. Some of them have had to have been corrected. Some of them have have, have flagged errors. Some of them have run without. Uh, any trouble at all? So, um, the, the the way to, to sort of discuss how how you kind of use it is to is, is via the templates tab. The templates tab is where you define something you want to work with. So you get a bunch of of um, pre rolled ones. Um, so um, I'm going to I'm going to pull up that one there. MPEG two SD PAL. So this is this is a standard definition PAL. So maybe you were you know if you were a few years ago I suppose if you were delivering D10 50 megabit PAL that kind of thing. This is a, a you know a, t a template that might be a good starting point for starting to build the template for your uh, deliverable um, you know testing. Uh, yeah. You, you, you can you can see this clearly on my on my screen sharing. Can you, Hugh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, I can see it. So, so here we go. I've got I've got. So this is the template editor, and the template editor has got four tabs along the top of it: file details, video checks, audio checks, and general settings. Um, and they do exactly what you'd expect. So so so, so um, here's my my, my file uh, details, and and of course, not surprisingly, the first thing is the container. Uh, what what kind of container format are we talking about? Uh, you, you know, is it um, a, a, a transport stream, a program stream, an MXF file? Uh, you, you know, is a, a MP4 or a QuickTime MOV? You know, all those different things. And so, if I select, say, MXF, maybe we're we we're interested in an MXF um, wrapped file. Um, the, the 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 thing that below it that then becomes uh, alive is the MXF operational pattern. Of course, if if we're dealing with um, with Avid, OP1 At OP Atom is the is the preferred um, uh, MXF format. Otherwise, it's it's OP1A. Um, but maybe we're not worried about container formats at all. We just want it to you know deal with any MPEG file that we submit to it. We're not worried about, about whether it's a, a MOV wrapped file or an AVI wrapped file or a transport stream or whatever. Uh, you know, we're not worried about the container format. Don't don't check that. If 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 this box here is checked it'll check it if it's not it won't and then the other box on the other side is reject on error so if it finds an error it'll 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 kick it back and say look you know you've asked me to check this file but um you know i can tell you immediately that it's not a it's not a, a an mxf file like you asked for kind of thing and that's very typical for all the different things you can check relating to the file type so you know video codec obviously it might be mxf wrapped it might be op1 atom um, f uh, variant of MXF, uh, you know, and then you can say what kind of MPEG uh, we'd like to find within there, and uh, or in fact, what kind of co you know video essence we'd like to find within there. But this template is defaulted to MPEG two because that's the uh, thing we're checking for. 
and uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Uh, you know, basically anything that can be derived from the from the file header, and by examining the, the the file, it's in there. And so the frame size, the chroma sampling style. You know, maybe maybe we, we only want 42 files. Should a should a miscreant 411 file make it through, then we want to check the reject on error um, uh, box to say no, no, don't don't check for that. Um, pixel aspect ratio and frame aspect ratio. Of course, um, you know what's declared in the in the file header may not be consistent with what it finds within the file. You know, 720 by 576, um, whether it's widescreen or 4 by 3 is never square pixels. Uh, you know, so, so, so uh, you know, it might declare in the header that it is a one-to-one -one square pixel, but actually, you know, when you look at the resolution of the file and the, the declared aspect ratio, it might be wrong. So there are all these kind of things. Clean aperture is 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 a is a parameter for submitting to iTunes. So if you're finishing if you're submitting finished material to iTunes, that that's a very sort of standard one to have to uh, deal with. Um, and then it's you know frame rates and uh, anything you you, you might you, you might want to get you might want to get busy about and, and worried about. It's in there. The file duration, you know, the bit rates. Maybe you're submitting your file to a DVD mastering facility, and they've said we'll accept MPEG two between six and nine megabits per second. That's very standard for DVD. And so, you know, given that DVDs are always encoded variable bit rate, because you want to be able to exploit the detail where you can, you want to be able to, you know, get the bit rate where it can go. Um, uh, you know, people will use variable bit rate encoding for, for, for DVD mastered files. And so consequently, you have to check, you know, have I, have at any point during this file, have, have I been really fast and loose? And have I gone outside the spec for what my bit rates can be? Um, uh, you know, all the other things you might want to check if there's embedded time code within the within the within the uh, the, the file. And uh, that might just be uh, the container time code or it might be that the, the embedded, you know, ancillary code that lives in the elemental stream. Yeah, you can check that they, they correspond and such. Start time code, you know, maybe you're really worried that your program is starts at 10 hours as delivered kind of thing. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously MPEG files can have uh, an embedded AV delay. Um, uh, you know, and that can be problematic, particularly in, in some of the uh, transport stream delivery formats. Um, you know, if the if the audio blocks are coming every set of every group of pictures, every twelve frames, every iframe, that can be problematic, and maybe you don't want that to be the case. Um, drop frame code is you know, if we're in America, are we delivering drop frame code, and is it really drop frame code? You know, it might declare that it's drop frame code and, and etc. And time code continuity. So so they're all the kind of things that are test that are checked for very quickly, but are typically checked for you, you know to make sure that this is this is a properly formatted. Uh, video file that we're delivering. Yeah. So that's, that's one one bunch of things. The next tab along is video checks, and if we if we dive in there, um, this is kind of where 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 we start getting to the real meat of of, of video QC. Um, uh, VBI, you know, is is there, is there anything going on in the in the vertical blanking interval that we're worried about? Like, you know, um, you know, six oh eight line with with captions up there, all that kind of thing. You know, do we do we want to worry about that? Um, uh, uh, you know, for all these tests that are coming later on, so testing for letterboxing and pillarboxing has 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 wrongly form aspect ratio formatted stuff wound up in this finished conform. You know, are we just testing for the first few seconds of the file, or do we really need to pay attention to the whole file? Um, uh, all all the things that, that that I suppose we call traditional video QC chroma levels, black levels, RGB gamuts, and and here we've got an interesting additional set of of boxes. We've got a correct set of boxes. So so you see here, as well as rejecting on error, we can correct on error, um, which is rather splendid. You've got an height legalizer in here, basically, um, which is is just the job. If uh, you know if if this is, you know. You know, close oh, to how air. How good a job does it do? Of it? It does a very good job. All the things I've tested so far, it does a very good job. It does does as good a job as a hardware legalizer does. Okay. Um, here's the next thing to check for: uh, color bars. Uh, do, you know, do, the color bars appear within the file. Now, obviously, you might you might the, your delivery spec might say we need some color bars at the head of the file, but hey, you don't want color bars during the file because you know who wants to see color bars on air? So 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 you can check for color bars and and you know over a certain size of the screen and we can't tolerate them for more than so many. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that can that, that allows you to check for the presence of, of a test signal within program material. But um, you know, maybe that's not important to you. Maybe 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 you trust your online editor to have, have done all that. Uh, black frames, obviously, you know, yeah. things fade, fade to back during a television program, but not maybe for five seconds. You know, maybe maybe you're worried about you know big black holes in the middle of your program, and similarly with freeze frames, you, you know, you can detect it can detect frozen video within. 
you can detect frozen video within a, a finished program and you, know, you can define what proportion of the screen you're looking across what proportion of um, you know how long the freeze frames allow for and stuff um, you, know, you can imagine that maybe something's been prepped with with lower thirds uh, that run throughout the whole program that's very typical of things like infomercials uh, and and the lower third may have animated logos on and stuff but hey what happens if if material that isn't in the lower third has frozen you, you know you can you can set it up to check for all that kind of stuff blockiness you know maybe you're worried about miscreant uh you know material that's been encoded one time too many winding up in your program and you and you're worried about pixelation it'll check for that field order field order is very interesting because obviously some codecs do their fields the wrong way around. I say the wrong way around, they, they don't do the odd field first and the even field second. They do the even field first and the odd field second. Uh, so some DV codecs do that, you know, particularly DV cam, the Sony variant. And so this can check for not only are the fields as declared correct, but it can also pass the video and it can look for that for that interfield, you know, where, where the, where the, yes. which looks awful when you see it on a video monitor, but you know, you can miss it on a computer monitor because computer monitor be, being a progressive device. Uh, dropouts. It can detect for uh, it can detect video dropouts. If you've got lots of archive material from one inch or UMAT or something, it can it can detect the dropouts, and it does a very very reasonable job of correcting them as well. See, so there's a correct wow. box for for dropouts uh, and flashing. So here we go. This is this is um, and again, look, they're 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 aiming at the the DPP spec because they talk about their, uh, their 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 flash spec as being plus or minus twenty candelas per meter squared on on the average picture content. And so they do, they do, they do the Ofcom stroke DPP te test, but not the Harding test. They can't do that. So that's that's the, all the things that can check for in the video domain. And then audio. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff in audio. Now they have this thing called uh, tracks numbers, and that's not the tracks that we'd think of: left channel, right channel, etc. They call a track a a finished audio uh, piece. So the stereo track or the 5.1 uh, AC3 encoded surround track. Uh, so, given that a file can carry multiple audio tracks, maybe maybe for delivery for Freeview, uh, you're delivering a stereo, a 5-1 surround, and an audio description mono track. They would be, in, in vid checker terms, there would be three tracks, and you'd have to set up three sets of tests within the audio tab to check for all of them, or just the ones you're interested in. Maybe you're not worried at all about the audio description track. Who knows? But again, same same stuff in the audio description tab. Uh, codec, bit depth, sample rates, etc., etc., uh, is even the track present? You know, and does it have the num the number of the number of uh, channels on it? It said you, you you said it would have phase coherence. You know, the last thing you want yeah. is is stereo material to go out phasing coherent, so that when it gets mono together in the kitchen uh, television, suddenly all the yes. you know yeah you, know, you, know, you know all you can hear is the uh, is is the background uh, noise and, and non none of the program material. Uh, test tone is does test tone appear during the during the finished uh, program? And if so, you know how much of that is tolerable, or you know, you know, the last thing you want is is five seconds of of lineup tone in the middle of a program. So it'll test for that. Clipping, which is um, uh, not digital um, max, it's it's checking for audio that has been clipped previously in the post production process. So maybe you've got material that has been rammed into the clippers at some point, but now it's been backed off and sounds bad, but isn't wrong, if you will. So it'll test yes. for that. And all these things, um, uh, you, you know, it'll test over multiple channels, you, you know, to, to, to let you know if it's it's kind of there on, on you know, all... all uh, so this is typically for 7.1 audio because um, that's that's typically the most we deliver for for telly. Um, clicks and pops, um, you know, the kind of things that you know, sort of AES damage might have left in the file. Uh, dial norm. Now, if I go back and select a, 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 a codec type that can accept... Um, um, like so, AAC, AAC. No, no. Let's go for let's go for Dolby AC3. Maybe Dolby AC3 can carry multi-channel audio. And then if we go down to here, that we can liven up the the, the, the dial norm selector. Now dial norm is very interesting. Dial norm is is a bit of it's a bit of metadata that lives in the Dolby data. And yeah. uh, and what it is is it's a measurement of the uh, normalization required on the dialogue to make a decent mix with relation to the rest of the audio and it's well, what it's meant for is is if you've got a very elaborate expensive home cinema surround sound amplifier at home under, under your telly but maybe the kids have gone to bed maybe everybody's gone to bed it's very very quiet and you just want to watch this film uh quietly 
uh, the, now, a very quiet volume. You might not get a great a great effect. You know, the 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 the, the, the voices the voices will be far too quiet. Whereas you've you've wound the volume of your telly down or or your surround sound speakers down enough so that the explosions and the loud music don't wake the kids up. Uh, and so uh, the dial norm figure basically allows you to have a riding uh, dial normalization figure within the audio track that if there's a very quiet conversation that comes up to a listenable level. Uh, and so but basically gives it gives your 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 surround sound damp at home a modicum of control over the mix if you will is, is that is that control derived from something that was done in the mix or is it an algorithm working out what it could Tip, do? typically in the pro tool session in the audio session uh, when you when you're prepping that ac3 file the software derives that figure you know as a continuously changing figure throughout the whole program so so it's it's part of the, the, the dolby has three um bits of metadata a uh, dial norm Oh, I can't remember the other two. They all start with D. Dial norm, um, and, and, and they're all meant to aid a a, a high end surround sound amp in its efforts to make a better mix for you. Now, okay. dial norm is interesting because um, you, so the choices are you can either leave it unchanged within the file, or you can set it to the output loudness. So so you can have vid check and make it right if it's wrong, and that's what the, the the correct checkbox does. Or you can just leave it set to a continuous figure throughout the whole file. Now you think to yourself, well, if you've got this fantastic facility, why on earth would you want to just leave it, say, at at uh, Neg twenty four um, uh, dBFS? Uh, and that's because some broadcasters specify that. Some broadcasters say Sky in particular. They say, uh, don't don't deliver a style norm set correctly. Uh, just leave it set to Neg twenty four, because what Sky do is they use the dial norm figure to control the volume of the set top box. And the thinking is. <laughs> That it's a method of getting around um, uh, the um, R128 or the uh, ITU 1770 loudness specs, where where if if the whole industry conforms to those specifications, we'll wind up with commercial breaks that sound lo no louder than the program. But this is almost like the broadcaster kind of keeping in its back pocket a method of cranking up the loudness of your set top box um, during the ad breaks to kind of get so around that. Passes all the loudness tests pre-transmission, yep. and then at the other end we just wind it up again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so nobody's really come out and said that for sure, but that's the kind of thinking. That's that's the, what everybody thinks is going to happen. Um, and then there's some other stuff. There's there's sort of traditional PPM type levels, you, you know, and, and and either for it's it's, it's rather good. Look, there's the uh, there's the M6 uh, standard for, uh, for for FM radio, you know, and 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 uh, and, and, and AB and such, and you, you can specify PPM levels. Uh, you can specify more traditional sort of DBFS, um, I say more traditional, you know, more contemporary um, uh, digital type levels, and uh, and you can you can limit uh, dB true peak levels, uh, so that's that's less forgiving than the PPM levels, or and more, most importantly, you can set it to make everything correct from a uh, a loudness perspective. So so the the LUFS measurements. Mm -hmm. Of, of rolling loudness, which is coming as part of 1770 or um, uh, um, uh, EBU R128, which is the specification in Europe. They're pretty much the same now. Uh, this allows us to get things right for that rolling loudness figure, which uh, all the broadcasters are keen to have to uh, prevent uh, people from mixing commercials very very perceivably loudly even though they're not then they're, they're, they're known yeah. they're no louder from a ppm point of view you know if you had a ppm on it's top yeah if you had that ppm on top of your television like i do at home well no i don't really but <laughs> <laughs> um you, you know that you, you get the point you, you know I, I refer i refer everybody back to the um the audio uh, episode we did last year um and so once once you've set up your that first audio track you can you can add another track so maybe you've set that up for the stereo mix you can also set it up for the five one channels that are in there as well uh, and, and rather splendid you can clone it so that you're off to the same same set of values again you know which is typical um so that's audio that's video and then there's some general settings related to a template um, you know what priority do we give to this template? Maybe in a facility you could imagine that they're doing lots of archive material that has no real sort of urgency to it, so long as it gets done. And you might assign those templates a very low priority. And maybe you've got tonight's news program that has very high priority. You know, just stop all the other tests that are going on because this one has to go through ahead of everything else. So, 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 so templates can have a, a priority associated with them. 
and uh, you, you know there's lots of things what do we do if we have to correct the file what do we do with a corrected file you know do we write the fa file back out again in the format that it arrived in or do we write it back out uncompressed as 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 wav and and an and avi uncompressed yuv data you know if it if it passes where do we put it if we if it's rejected where do we put it all that kind of stuff you know you've got kind of a, a sort of a whole management process of of you know, putting things back in the in the machine room operator manager's computer to say, look, this has to be have attention applied to it now, or it's passed. We've stuck it on the transmission server. Yeah, there's lots of lots of things you can imagine, and, and there's even down to how we generate the report. Is it an XML report? Is it a PDF? Do we save it to the network? Do we email it to the engineer? What do we? Well, you know, all that kind of stuff. So a very very comprehensive set of things. Including your own style sheet, I see as well. Yeah, well, if it's X, if it's XML, you've got to be able to make sense of it, haven't you? You know. Yes, that's basically no, yes. No, 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 so. nobody nobody wants to look at code, do they? <laughs> <laughs> um so so um uh, boom, boom, uh so I, I might as well I might as well uh, test something now so 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 that's that's how you define a template so let's go to task setup now so task setup let's select that that mpeg that mpeg uh spal sd thing we were playing with and let's find a a bit of media so this is my uh, demo footage and I know for a fact this is a 50 megabit MPEG delivery format file. It's commercial for for Magnum Ice Cream, um, and uh, it doesn't doesn't feature anybody with uh, splendid mustaches. More's the pity. But uh, <laughs> so so this is this is if I'm if I'm submitting something manually to VidChecker, you know, which maybe the machine room operator does, you know, on a finished program. But equally, you can set up uh, watch folders where watch folders have templates associated with them and uh, you know you might have a, a, a watch folder on your network which is where you know the editors know to put all the finished MTV programs and you'd have a t an MTV template that was watching that folder and you might include a bunch of other sort of uh, definers like uh, you know um, you know we'd limit it to certain file name pattern types or you know modified in the last day maybe because you know they tend to leave stuff in that folder or what you know there's lots of things you can imagine you might want to do with that very sort of comprehensive so we've said okay uh it's a an mpeg2 sd pal test we want to do because that's that's the template we've got uh it's that file because that's we know that's been prepped ready for transmission it's a it's a 30 second commercial uh you know it's going to be copied onto the transmission server hopefully and we'll start the task so off it goes uh, and uh that's kind of working away in the background. If I go to the task monitor, which is the, the next tab along, and my poor old computer here is really struggling because we're doing our screen recording code, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. But um, so here we, here, 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 here we go. So here's my here's my vid checker um, um, uh, status uh, feed. You can see that, uh, that that's been submitted. Uh, I've got, we've got a spinning uh, hourglass to show that it's being processed. And in fact, if I wanted to, I could ju I can just I just, just Oh, it's, it's finished already and we've got a red warning to say that something wasn't right so let's go in there and have a look at our report oh right okay video frame size 720 by 608 is different from the qu required frame size of 720 so so immediately uh, there was something wrong with the file and 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 look there's the there's the uh, there's all the things it's, it's telling us about the file but we know something's wrong uh, because we got, we got the the red light and, and and that's the reason it was rejected uh, so you say to yourself oh right okay I've got to start I've got to start making a proper template now for testing these types of files um, and in fact template management and making templates traditionally is the hardest part of, of video QC file based QC but rather splendidly and I think VidCheck is the only one that does this you've got this little button down here that says auto template oh, yeah. so if we click auto template what it does now is it examines the file that we submitted and it builds a template based on that being a perfect version of the deliverable so if you've got a known good file particularly maybe the broadcast has given you a known good file you can say okay let's build a template using your file as the template so maybe let's 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 give this a um eng bench test so there we go so okay so we've made a new template uh, called eng bench test based on the magnum mpeg file as being our input file so let's go back to templates um, and uh, let's have a look at that where is it eng bench test let's go in there and we can have a look at some of the uh, some of the things it's set for that and of course a lot of these things it, it can only derive stuff about the file it can't derive anything related to the to, to the, to the um, essence you know it, it doesn't do it but but for all the things that are hard for codex style you know chroma subsampling styles you know wrappers all those kind of things which take a long time to scratch your head and get right 
we're off to the races. We're immediately off. You know, we've got a good starting point. You know, all the things that are derivable from from the known good file are now set into the template. So now we can go really back. Cool. It's, yeah. it's a very good idea, isn't it? So now we go back and well, let's let's redo the the, the, the test. We'll retest that file, but uh, we'll use eng bench test template. So let's okay. start start the task again, uh, and off it goes. And let's go to the task monitor. Uh, and there it is, submitted, using EngBench test as our template. And there it is, chugging along 2%, 5%. Now, the rather splendid thing now is that if we click on, on, on the, the line in the, the task monitor, it'll take us to the report as it is so far. So oh, we, do, right. we, we don't have to wait for the file to be finished before we can start looking at stuff. And so far, uh, you, you know, it's found, uh, um, uh, you know, between uh, zero frames and eight frames, which looks like it's the, the clock at the head of the file. It's found chroma levels that, that were wrong. But we might not worry, but it's up to us to decide yeah. if we want to do anything. Yeah. So here we go, still, still chugging along, sort of nearly halfway through the file. Again, I, I can't sort of stress enough, this is because we're running the server, the GUI, uh, our screen recorder, you know, and lots Skype. of other things on my laptop. So, 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 so typically, typically this would be instantaneous on a contemporary, you know, uh, eight core computer, you know, that was set aside for the purpose. And you can see now it's starting to build, it's starting to build clip frames of, of, of what it's finding. Um, what it, the nice thing about it is that it doesn't just throw up an error for every frame that it finds the error. If it finds an error consistently across you know, 30 seconds worth. It'll say, starting out there, finishing there, I found this error and it was consistent throughout. Uh, but, the, but so here we go. So we're, we're seeing lots of, lots of kind of, uh, you know, chroma and black level type errors are in here. There they all are you know, as our file gets built. In fact, we're, we're three quarters of the way through the file now and, and quite, a, quite a lot of things are wrong. So, so clearly we'd like to maybe go back into the template now and start checking correct, 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 yeah. correct. So, um, I know for a fact that when we were when I was um, just rehearsing myself for this afternoon, I I did this one time already, and so I know for a fact if I go into um, uh, the folder, there will already be some corrected versions of the files in there. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to delete them because that will spoil our demo otherwise. So uh, where am I? Where's my vid checker demo footage? And there we go. So 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 from the eighth of April. So that's, that's a f oh, that was a couple of days ago actually. I think we're we'll doing some training. There's some corrected versions of the file, but I'm going to delete those for the minute because um, uh, we're going to do that again. And they're gone. So let's get rid of that. And look, we're nearly finished now. 88% um, so far. And we've we found lots of we found lots of nasties in this file. Pretty much everything. Even the pack shot's got lots of problems with it. So as a commercial, it's not very good. Not, not good enough for transmission. So let's just give it a second to finish and we'll, we'll go back and we'll set the, all the correct parameters and we'll resubmit it and we'll see what, what it comes out with. See what it does. Okay. Um, now I'm not going to do this because I know it'll really, it'll really laden my computer down. But if you click on any of these clip frames, it launches a viewer and parks you at that part of the, of the file. Oh, neat. So, you, so you can very easily go in and have a look and see see it, the, the things that were wrong as it was going along, and you can sort of like you know scrub over the area of the pictures that were that were found to be incorrect. Oh, that's smart. Yes. Yeah. So here we do. We're, we're, we're done, uh, and we've got we've got a we've got a red uh, warning, uh, you know, an orange warning to say that things weren't good. Uh, you know, we can click the notes, but but we've already got the the report down here. It's written in in the folder that we defined. It's written this out as as a PDF for us, so we could do stuff with that. And and the very last thing it, it sticks in the file if you asked it to is is the audio um, uh, loudness measurement for the piece uh, so measured loudness across the stream duration was neg 22.3 LUFS within one LUFS of the required loudness of neg 23 LUFS so so at least the loudness of this commercial is correct but, you know the, 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 one, the one thing that the commercials normally get wrong is correct but uh, but all our video levels are all over the place so let's go back into our template and let's edit um, edge bench test and in video checks Let's go and start um, enabling some, come on, slow computer. Let's go and start enabling some correction pieces. So I've, I've enabled correction for all the video tests. And let's save that. So now uh, EngBench test is saved with correction turned on. So we go back to task setup and we resubmit that with EngBench test and go to task monitor and uh, uh, that will uh, 
go to task monitor there we go so off it starts again now and uh, uh, and we, we can see it chugging along and uh, let's go and see it doing that live and hopefully we'll see corrections happening as we go so um, there's one facility I was doing training at uh, about a month and a half ago and uh, they, uh, they've been running a file-based QC and a traditional eyeball QC in parallel for about six months. And, uh, well, it was a test. Yes, and they've just got to the point now where they're confidently cutting across to file-based QC and, and kind of almost decommissioning the QC desks where people look at things on scopes. Um, really? So here we go. Look, we're 28% we're through the file, and it's already made some corrections. It found that same, the same trouble on the clock at the head of the file, but it's corrected it, uh, and, uh, and off we go, uh, correcting as it goes. Now, um, I have a feeling that in the template, I didn't enable write it out as the, in the same format that you got the file. I think it's probably not re-encoding it. It's writing it out as separate files. So um, I might... I might stop the task now, and uh, no, well, let's, let's let it go. Uh, <laughs> so now we're looking at this, the file as it's building up. Yep, and you can see that that. that um, uh, you know all those things that were that through as errors. It's now, it's now we've, we're getting green checks to say that it successfully corrected them, which is what you'd hope it would do. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, it, it 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 doesn't seem to impact very much on the processing time. Um, we've got one facility that used this for 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 delivery to iTunes for di for for high, high res movies. In fact. What they do is they produce a mezzanine format of, of ProRes at 185 megabit per second, so high-quality high-res ProRes. And they use that to, to derive their iTunes deliverable and also the uh, format that gets passed on to the Blu-ray mastering facility. And so they, they do lots of classic English 70s gangster films like The Long Good Friday and things like that, you know. Oh, really? And, and, uh, and Lion Films, I think that was the film company from the 70s that yeah. did all those movies. And, uh, and so they use VidChecker as their as their kind of catch-all for delivery to iTunes. Because iTunes are very strict. If you deliver more than five files to iTunes with problems, they'll strike you off their register. And you know, you'll never deliver again to iTunes, which is, seems very severe. But, uh, it's draconian. Even. Yeah. But they, they do provide a lot of help you know, for setting yourself up kind of thing. But they don't tolerate any nonsense. So here we go. Almost done. So this is a, this is a, a fairly must-have tool in the modern facility, I think. You'd think so. Now, VidChecker, I think, is it's of 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 the big ones. It's the cheapest. It's about four thousand pounds to get yourself started. They have to they, they they do bill you for sort of options like H.264 and things like that because they're they're payable licenses to to somebody to the yeah. MPEG forum or to Apple or whoever. Um, but generally speaking, to get your foot in the door with the basic product, it's about £4,000. And then the options are all kind of £400, £800. I think the most expensive option is Dolby E, which is £1,200, which is because Dolby charge a lot to license their technology. Uh, but compared to some of the others, which are kind of £10,000 gets your foot in the door, and each option is £4,000, you know, it's, it's a remarkably good value piece of software. Yeah. They're very responsive. You know, when we've suggested things to them, they've, they've produced bespoke versions very quickly. And they're just kind of nice guys. They're based in Bristol, and uh, you know it's Bristol, eh? yeah in Bristol. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> um, so so here we go. We, we, the the QC now is finished, and, and it's corrected everything. It's given us our little audio report for the end there. And if I go and and pop up the folder that it's been dropping those things back into, we can see it sort by date modified. There we go. Uh, today, at, oh, is that the time? I should go home for tea in a minute. Um, but <laughs> but because I didn't have the um, I didn't have the re-encode to the input format selected, it's it's written them out as as uncompressed, very very large uncompressed files. Um, I won't I won't. I won't, we won't go through the tedious process of re-encoding them again and stuff because you know we, obviously we've seen how it's seen how it works. It can be done. So so that's I suppose that's really that's my little demonstration of a vid checker and, and, and a file based kind of QC and correction as it's going. Uh, and, it's really uh, fascinating because um, it just so happens that I'm working on a project where I'm going to need something like this. I would think I can't imagine what make I'm going to recommend, but it. Uh, 
who knows? But um, you know, it's it's really very useful indeed, and a way of seeing inside the files, which otherwise there's no way of getting a probe into. Yeah, it, 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 indeed, and uh, and uh, you know, people have to get to the point where they've got confidence in a delivery mechanism. Um, uh, you know that works for their facility. You know, uh, we, we've been very spoiled. You know, by having the lingua franca of HDSDI and yeah. timecode. Uh, you know, but all of a sudden, like you, like you, like you alluded to previously, you know, that there, there are literally hundreds of file formats and raster sizes and audio codecs, and you, you know, without without sensible management of all that, you know, it all goes goes horribly wrong. <laughs> well, there is, and I know we're trying to do our little bit for it, but there's a mighty amount of. Um, ignorance about it because the manufacturing uh, world has produced all this stuff and there are any number of adjustments that you can make and little boxes you can tick and numbers you could change yes now the, the thing i show people without knowing what you're doing the thing i show so, people uh, is 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 um a, a little um a piece from uh, so, so just to, it won't take a moment to pop this up i think it's a very informative slide though um is uh sony's ex range um mm -hmm. uh uh, so EX3, EX1, uh, XD Cam, uh, all those products. Um, if you look at um, uh, how many um, uh, formats, codecs, raster sizes you get just from the EX product range, it's staggering. So, so here we go. Let me uh, let me scroll down through this. this. These are just some notes for some training I was doing recently. We'll look at these all sort of traditional QCE type things uh, going through. Um, so no and I've picked up the wrong file bear with a second and we'll have something sensible Maybe. we're getting some free information here extra and uh, bonus to the program <laughs> okay so it was actually in digital and no no come on come on come on come on See, my, my computer's slowing right down because of this, uh, all, all the stuff we're, we're asking of it. Um, running Microsoft Windows and Mac at the same time. Who would have thought? Um, and to think the whole thing starts off as an infinitely long paper tape. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> yeah. The Turing Universal Machine. I'm not particularly um, au fait with maths. I, mean, I was absolutely number blind, pretty much. But I'm rereading and thoroughly enjoying um, Simon Singh's Fermat's Last Theorem. Which is yes, it's a brilliant book, isn't it? Great, a great journey. Yes. He also has a good. Uh, he also has a good book about um, um, cryptography, which I really enjoyed. Oh, okay. Yes, because you're a bit of a closet cryptographer. I, 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 I like the crypto. Yeah. Okay. Oh, listen, I'm, I'm struggling to find this slide, but it's basically... Oh, no, here we go, here we go. So so it's the slide before this one. Here we are. Uh, so this is... What we see here is all the possible formats uh, that you can get off uh, Sony's XD Cam product line. So uh, what we've got, one, two, three, four, five formats. How many containers? What, four different containers? One, two, three, four, five codec types. Different bit depths, different color sampling structures, different raster sizes, a plethora of frame rates. You, you, you know, interlaced, non-interlaced, progressive. Um, you know, constant bit rate, variable bit rate, and and multiple audio codecs as well. You, you think, just my word, if, if if one manufacturer in one product line is doing this, what hope is there? You, you yeah. know, just very very hard to see how how we can uh, um, you know get to grips with it all. Which is why the DP uh, thing is, is actually a, at least a marker in the sand. You can say, right, well, we'll, we'll try and conform to that. And it gives us somewhere to start, doesn't it? Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, it's been really good. And I suggest you get your supper fairly soon. Indeed. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry as a hungry man. So uh, I'll see you soon, Hugh. And we'll be, back, uh, we'll be back soon, possibly with traditional QC or possibly with um, uh, hardware too because I've, I've been enjoying the Raspberry Pi for a couple of weeks now I've, I've got it doing various things I'm very impressed I think it's a brilliant mine isn't, mine isn't doing anything particularly well it's very clever but I haven't done anything very clever to it it's working uh, as, a, as a little media centre which is a you know fantastic a dead easy 
saying yes. Yeah. yeah. I particularly like as I can control it from my phone. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can power it off the USB service port on the back of your telly, yeah. which is just brilliant. It comes on when the telly comes on. Okay. <laughs> I will. Uh, I will see you soon, Mr. Waters. Time. Yes, indeed. <laughs>